The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. My name is Glenda Cleasy, Agronomy Specialist with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. With me today is Andrea Lauder, Communications Manager also with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. And I would like to thank her today for looking after the functioning and administration of these webinars. Without her, they just wouldn't be possible. Welcome to all of you to our second webinar of the 2018 Pulse webinar series. We have two additional webinars scheduled and those can be found on the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers website under news and events. Topics that will be covered in upcoming webinars include understanding and managing MRLs to maintain export markets, as well as insect scouting in pulse crops. CCA and CCSC credits are available for the webinar today. To get those CCA credits for today's webinar, you must be watching it live. For those who attended the webinar, Andrea will send out an email after the webinar requesting CCAs. At this time, you can respond with your CCA number. If more than one person is watching from one computer, you will need someone to verify those in attendance and you may include all CCAs in attendance. Webinars will be recorded and posted to the SPG website for future viewing and for those who are unable to attend or for those of you here to do today who want to look back at the material that was covered. Recordings will be posted to the SPG website under the communications tab. For today's webinar, all participants will be muted. We will be happy to take your questions. To ask a question, please type it into the question box that's located in the GoToWebinar dashboard. You can send questions at any time throughout the webinar, but we will hold the questions until the end of the presentation. I'd like to welcome our speaker today, who is Dr. Jeff Shadow. Jeff is a professor of soil fertility and a professional agrologist who works in the Department of Soil Science at the University of Saskatchewan. He holds the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture Soil Nutrient Management Chair in the College of Agriculture and Bioresources and is a fellow of the Agricultural Institute of Canada. He was born in Saskatchewan and completed his undergraduate and graduate degrees in the College of Agriculture at the University of Saskatchewan. Jeff is going to speak to us today on micronutrients in pulse production. I will now turn the presentation over to you, Jeff. Great. Thank you very much, Glenda, for the introduction. I'm happy to be here today to uh, speak to folks about micronutrients in pulse production. And I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of, of folks who have worked in this topic with me over the past uh, five or six years, uh, graduate students, uh, postdoctoral fellows, and research associates who have uh, contributed to this uh, body of work that I'm going to be referring to uh, uh, today in my presentation. I guess uh, as, a, as a bit of a, of, a, of a background, micronutrients, of course, we recognize those as being uh, nutrient elements that are required in very small amounts. And in fact, for some of the micronutrients, the plant uptake is oftentimes less than one, pounds per, when, less than one pound per acre, and sometimes uh, only a few ounces per acre if you, if you work out the, the, the amount of, of uh, micronutrient that is uh, taken up by the plant. But nonetheless, uh, uh, despite being required in very small amounts, certainly still essential. And as I say, they're really no less important in plant nutrition than our macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or sulfur. In terms of, of thinking of micronutrients of, of interest for Saskatchewan crops, a listing of these would be copper, zinc, iron, boron, manganese, chlorine. Uh, there's a couple of other functional nutrient elements like uh, molybdenum and cobalt. And these are micronutrients, functional elements that are involved in nitrogen fixation, but really for which deficiencies are unheard of in the prairies. For the purposes of today's discussion related to uh, micronutrients in pulse production, the nutrient elements that I'm going to emphasize are copper, zinc, and iron. And I guess when we think about micronutrients, uh, I guess we always think of them a little bit as, as perhaps a bit mysterious or maybe ghostly for a lack of a, of a better term. Uh, and the reason why is that uh, uh, indeed there, the deficiencies of micronutrients uh, sometimes appear and then disappear. Uh, they also are, are a little bit of masters of disguise in the sense that symptoms are, are easily confused with, with other forms of, uh, of stress. <clears throat> 
And indeed, oftentimes it's a unique combination of soil, environmental and crop conditions that are needed, in fact, for that deficiency to show up, to manifest itself. And really that makes it rather difficult uh, and inherently challenging to conclusively diagnose and predict responses to uh, micronutrient fertilization for any crop really. And indeed that's because we often see the responses to those micronutrients uh, often small, fleeting and, uh, and variable. As a bit of background uh, to uh, micronutrients in terms of plant availability uh, for the micronutrient metals, copper, zinc, and iron, a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, lead into how they're absorbed. Uh, the micronutrient metals are typically absorbed by roots as cations, that is positively charged ions, but they move around in the soil. They tend to move around in the form of chelates. And a chelate refers to a micronutrient metal that's complexed with soluble organic matter. So as shown there, a micronutrient cation like zinc, which actually tends to be rather immobile in the soil, will complex, will react with a, a soluble organic uh, uh, molecule in the soil solution, a chelating agent, and form this chelate. In this case, zinc being held in a ring type structure, uh, bonded to it. And what that does functionally is it makes that micronutrient mobile, able to move. It keeps it in solution, keeps it mobile, and therefore available. In terms of micronutrient uptake, uptake occurs through the roots and also through the foliage. And that's why foliar applied micronutrients can be effective as a way of addressing a micronutrient deficiency. Fertilizer forms of micronutrients, some micronutrient metals, common fertilizer forms are salts like copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, iron sulfate. We also have chelated formulations, which are typically applied at lower rates. Uh, another form are oxides, which tend to be of lower solubility than the uh, salt forms and a more slowly available form. And I guess I would be remiss if I didn't also include manures as a source of micronutrient uh, uh, for uh, pulse production because uh, uh, manures out there do supply micronutrient elements like copper, zinc, and iron. The role of micronutrients in crop nutrition, uh, just a few words on this. I don't want to get too much into detail into the plant physiology, but uh, copper, zinc, and iron are involved in a number of important physiological processes in the plant. Uh, they're involved in electron transport, activation of many enzymes, uh, hormone regulation, and uh, they can also play indirect roles in terms of, of affecting plant health, uh, for example, in disease resistance. Uh, and, and a very good example of that is that copper deficiency may aggravate ergot infections in cereals because the uh, uh, deficiency causes the florets to remain open, open longer. And uh, also, in relation to copper, it also is a, a, an element that has fungicidal properties. And that uh, may be a factor that explains some of the responses that we've observed in some of our, our recent trials that I'll talk about in just a few minutes. When it comes to diagnosing micronutrient deficiencies, as I've already alluded to, a visual inspection alone can be rather risky, inconclusive. In fact, just thinking about the micronutrient metals, like for example, copper and or, uh, zinc and, and manganese and iron, sometimes they can produce uh, similar symptoms. For example, uh, zinc deficiency, iron deficiency can both sometimes produce uh, an intervenal chlorosis. So uh, using visual inspection alone uh, uh, is a good first uh, uh, a, a, a clue, but uh, we do need to uh, consider the, the, the use of the uh, diagnostic tools available to us indeed to be more conclusive. And as I say, soil and tissue testing are useful tools. Uh, the micronutrient tests have received a fair amount of criticism, uh, debate, uh, but I guess I would say, and, and in my experience, that uh, you know, as an attempt to measure a biologically significant fraction in the soil, indeed, some of the micronutrient tests are, are, are no better or worse than a lot of the macronutrient uh, uh, tests out there. And again, recognizing that there's a lot of factors that can come into play uh, and affect ultimately uh, whether we see a deficiency uh, occur and uh, because of that complexity uh, that test or assessment of availability in the soil is really only one part of the whole uh, complex rather complex puzzle. 
certainly variability is is something that we, we recognize very early on that's challenging uh, when it comes to dealing with micronutrient deficiency and, and fertilization issues. Uh, micronutrient variability can great, vary greatly across farm fields. Indeed, even over short distances, and that in fact makes it challenging as well in setting up research trials, you can have quite a bit of variability in availability of a micronutrient over a short distance. And I guess looking at some of our results, uh, uh, one of the micronutrients that tends to be really quite variable over short distances we find is zinc, for example. And uh, we find the deficiencies out there in the field to be variable, uh, localized, often tending to occur, as I indicate there, in patches. Maybe associated with a specific set of conditions out there in the field, uh, soil conditions like an eroded knoll, a sand or gravel lens that runs through the field. So that often those deficiencies are localized. We may have an area or zone of, of micronutrient deficiency, as, as indicated there, whereas the rest of the field is not deficient. And so, sampling strategy is really important, knowing where to look so that those zones may be identified and then dealt with uh, through a fertilization plan. Which uh, brings me to the topic of, of soil conditions. Soil conditions can give a good, or good uh, indication as to uh, potential likelihood of a micronutrient deficiency, really part of knowing where to look. And one of the important uh, soil conditions or parameters is the texture of the soil. And indeed, soils that are sandy, in texture, that tends to indicate there is a low content of minerals that are both capable of releasing through weathering, available forms of those micronutrients, and also a sandy texture tends to indicate a low ability of that soil to hold on to micronutrients. Sandy soil means low cation exchange capacity, and that cation exchange capacity is important in holding on to micronutrients, for example, micronutrient metals like uh, copper and zinc. pH of the soil is also a, a, can be a, a useful indicator, a predictor. Uh, generally, we say that as the pH of the soil increases, that is to say gets higher, the solubility and the availability of micronutrient elements tends to decrease. The exception to that is molybdenum. But generally, high pH can indicate uh, low solubility, low availability. Uh, Calcareous, high lime content that's associated with high pH, uh, in fact, uh, is responsible, we know, for fixing micronutrients like copper and zinc into less soluble forms, reducing their availability. Very low or very high organic matter contents can be associated with a greater incidence of micronutrient deficiency. Soils that are low in organic matter uh, can mean low cation exchange capacity, low ability to retain a micronutrient uh, protected against loss can contribute to low availability. On the other hand, soils that are very high in organic matter, like peaty soils, we recognize that peats contain no minerals. And uh, without those minerals, we don't have a supply of some of the micronutrient metals like copper, uh, zinc, and manganese. And finally, nutrient imbalances are an important consideration. Uh, it's long been known that high soil phosphorus uh, uh, can interfere with the uptake of zinc and copper. Uh, we hear uh, uh, referred to as a phosphorus-induced uh, zinc deficiency. So adding a large amount of phosphorus to a soil that's marginally deficient in zinc, uh, in fact, may induce a, a, a more severe uh, zinc deficiency and, and uh, uh, associated uh, uh, reduced productivity production. And uh, some of our more recent research work has shown that it can work the other way around too. And that is that uh, addition of copper and zinc uh, appears to reduce plant growth on, on phosphorus deficient soils. That seems to be related to perhaps some interference of high amounts of, of perhaps zinc on the uh, uh, uptake and translocation of the uh, 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 element in the plant when the soil is, is low in, in, in phosphorus. Overall, we would say then, uh, you know, sandy soils, uh, gray soils of low organic matter, also some very high organic matter soils, what we would refer to as peaty soils, those are soils that tend to have the greatest frequency of micronutrient deficiency.
just to show you the impact uh, relationship of, of soil properties on, on available uh, micronutrient, in this case, some work that was done by a, a PhD student, Noah Baraman, looking at available copper in 14 different soils from southern Saskatchewan. Available copper assessed as both extractable and also supply rate of, of copper using PRS and showing this inverse relationship inverse relationship in which higher sand content of those soils equates to lower availability of copper as indicated there in that PCA diagram. So said another way, uh, lower sand content uh, tends to equate uh, in these range of soils with a, a, a higher availability of, of copper. So again, pointing towards the importance of texture as a, a factor uh, that appears to be a good predictor of availability uh, in some soils for some, uh, some, some of the micronutrient elements. But that being said, folks, generalizations about where and when a micronutrient deficiency will occur uh, can be a little bit dangerous. So uh, indeed, we have our, our diagnostic tools, our soil and tissue tests. They can add, certainly add resolution. There is debates about critical levels, uh, and in fact, it's kind of hard to draw a specific line in the sand uh, in terms of deficient, not deficient, when it comes to uh, uh, micronutrient uh, uh, availability assessments. And so what we oftentimes see is a, a marginal range, maybe a range from, let's say, for an extraction 0.4 to 0.6 ppm that, 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 that reflects a range where you may or may not see a response, kind of, kind of, a, 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 of an in-between. And, and I guess that just really reflects the, the fact that, that, that oftentimes the responses to micronutrient fertilization are, are indeed uh, isolated and, and not clear cut. And that makes it difficult to establish specific recommendation criteria. So oftentimes in terms of a relationship of test level to expected response, we do have that gray area that represents that uncertainty out there, just reflecting the, the complex uh, factors that, that do indeed come together to affect uh, uh, response response to added micronutrient fertilizer. And so I guess we always say then really uh, you want to use as many uh, diagnostic tools as you can, a combination of, of soil and tissue testing, uh, plus some test strips is, is really going to be the most conclusive approach to, 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 to uh, assessing uh, uh, the likelihood of seeing a response to the micronutrient fertilization. And even then, just because you see a response in a test strip one year doesn't necessarily mean you're going to see a response out there the next year under a different set of, uh, of, uh, of conditions. So uh, uh, indeed it is, it is challenging. So with that bit of background then folks, uh, the second part of my presentation, I'd like to talk specifically about responses to micronutrient fertilization with emphasis on pulse crops. I'm gonna start out here with copper, uh, recognizing that cereals, uh, especially wheat, are crops that are most susceptible to, to copper deficiency here in Western Canada. And in fact, pulse crops are generally considered to have a low sensitivity to copper deficiency. And indeed, then, when you look at, at uh, um, um, the available information out there for, for uh, uh, deficiency symptoms, uh, what tends to come up first here in Western Canada for copper deficiency is the classic symptom on a cereal of a twisting, a pigtailing of the, of the leaf tips is shown there. Uh, when I went out looking for uh, pictures of copper deficiency in legumes, they're pretty scarce. In fact, searching across the web, I came across a couple out of Australia and, and, and those pictures weren't particularly, uh, I think, useful. So uh, I, I don't really have any pictures of copper deficiency in legumes uh, for you in my presentation. But I will talk a little bit uh, in relation to copper and uh, pulse crops. Uh, uh, some work that, uh, that's uh, been done by uh, uh, Dr. Ryan Hangs, working with me uh, in polyhouse research with a wide number, as you can see there, of soils collected across uh, Western Canada, looking at responses to copper, zinc, and boron in a wheat pea canola rotation. Specifically, uh, copper added to wheat versus not added, different forms and rates and then pea growing afterwards with and without zinc and then followed by canola growing on those same soils with and without boron fertilization, giving us an opportunity to look at micronutrient interactions over a rotational cycle. 
And what we found in this work, uh, this is the first year looking at response of uh, wheat, hard red spring wheat to copper. And this is with 12 mineral soils uh, collected from across Saskatchewan with a range of properties and which may be suspected to have some potential incidence of micronutrient deficiency. And in this first year, uh, uh, averaged across the soils, we did see uh, some significant responses to copper fertilization in the grain yield of that wheat in our polyhouse or greenhouse uh, a study that we did with the soils. Seeing uh, greatest responses to banded copper sulfate here, we also see some significant responses to foliar applied uh, uh, copper as well of the wheat. And the banded, we saw a little bit of a negative effect there, uh, probably because we had a little bit of toxicity in that case uh, with, uh, with that uh, uh, banded chelated copper fertilizer. But related to pulse crops after the wheat, we grew peas on those soils in the second year in 2006. And this allowed us to look at the response to the residual applications that we made of copper to the wheat and also to the zinc applications that we made in 2016. And what we can see here uh, compared to our uh, uh, unfertilized, no micronutrient added control, interestingly, we saw a significant yield response to the copper that we had applied to the wheat the year before. And uh, we really attribute this, it doesn't really seem to be a nutritional effect. Uh, we're attributing this maybe to a fungicidal effect of that copper uh, on reducing the incidence of uh, soil borne uh, disease uh, in the year after uh, we had applied the copper to the, to the wheat. The other interesting thing is that we did see this uh, uh, negative effect of zinc and copper manifesting itself added together uh, in a couple of our soils where, which were very phosphorus deficient. Uh, in terms of the effect of adding the zinc on the peas that year, we see a trend towards uh, some yield, uh, positive yield responses, but uh, they weren't statistically significant at the 5% level. So we saw a trend towards pea yield responding, resp responding positively to the soil and foliar application of zinc, but it wasn't statistically significant at a 5% level. But interestingly, we did see this uh, significant positive response to soil applied copper uh, the year before to the wheat. And uh, uh, not sure why this is, but uh, we're thinking it's, 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 it's uh, perhaps a fungicidal effect of the, of the copper, because copper is a, it is, is, is a fungicide as I, I talked about a little bit before. The other thing that we saw is this negative interaction when we add zinc and copper together on a phosphorus deficient soil. We've seen this in wheat and also we seem to see some evidence of this on, on peas growing the, the year after. Again, the mechanism for this seems a bit unclear whether it has to do with the effect of, of the, uh, of the uh, two elements together when we don't have phosphorus on translocation within the plant, so it may be physiology. Uh, we couldn't find any evidence for a, a, a reaction product in the soil related to this and uh, it may have something to do with with further decreasing the pea availability but uh, it's a it's an interesting uh, uh, observation that uh, that came out of some of this work I'll move on to uh, to zinc and uh, a bit of background, I guess, going back into the, the studies that were done uh, a few years ago, uh, some work done by J. Paul Singh at the U of S had 23 field trials in Saskatchewan uh, and uh, a variety of crops that that included as well peas and lentils and found only one significant yield response of the dryland crops to zinc fertilization. And uh, also in terms of the, of the ability of the uh, extractant to, to pick those soils out, uh, it was also variable as well. Well. And, and I have to say, probably not a huge amount has changed since then in terms of, of, we, of what we've found in some of our most recent research work with zinc on pulses. But moving ahead a little bit in time, uh, beans are a crop that uh, is considered uh, quite sensitive to zinc deficiency, also manganese. And some trials that were conducted in the late 1990s at the Irrigation Development Center at Outlook, uh, this was irrigated dry bean, uh, showed little response to zinc fertilization. Now these were soils that overall did, did tend to uh, have fairly high extractable zinc levels. Uh, other pulses, 
thinking about zinc deficiency in peas, I did also struggle a little bit to come up with some, some uh, photos here of zinc deficiency in, in symptoms in pea. Uh, these are a couple of photos out of Australia that show a, a kind of uh, bleaching around the leaf margins. I guess probably more common in terms of a zinc deficiency symptom in general in plants is uh, uh, small leaves, uh, uh, light color, um, um, yellow, yellow, yellow green rather than bright green. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in the past, many, many years ago, zinc deficiency was sometimes referred to as little leaf disease. So uh, perhaps these symptoms that show up here uh, as, a, as a small leaves, a light green color, pale green, even some uh, chlorosis in between the, uh, the leaf veins is probably a little bit more characteristic of what you might see, I think, for zinc deficiency uh, in, a, in, in a, a pea compared to what we see uh, up there. But uh, most recently, we've been doing, have done some work on uh, a response of lentils to uh, zinc fertilization. And we did a study where we collected 10 soils from across uh, uh, southern Saskatchewan in the lentil growing region. And uh, we found variable response to zinc fertilization on those 10 soils in the greenhouse. Uh, we saw a few positive responses uh, on brown uh, soil climatic zone soils from southwest and south central Saskatchewan. And indeed, it seems to be soils in the southwest, the south central portion of Saskatchewan, that most frequently have low availability of zinc according to soil test. Uh, soils that we worked with a little bit further north and east in the dark brown and black soil zone, we rather consistently didn't see a response to added a zinc on the lentils growing in those soils. Uh, this is a picture here of, of one soil, an ardeal soil, brown soil, uh, that had low available zinc, and this was with a small, uh, small green lentil. And we can see here a, a visual uh, response there to zinc fertilization. This was zinc sulfate that was soil applied, simulating a broadcast and incorporate type of application. We can see the, the higher plant, uh, the increased plant height and growth there uh, as a response to that zinc. But I have to say, in some cases, that didn't always translate into a, a grain yield increase. And in fact, looking at Dr. Maxud's results uh, in the 10 soils uh, summarized, uh, we had Chaplin Association, Haverhill, Hatton, Weyburn Association, Ardill, Fox Valley, Echo, so kind of from that south central, southwest, and also a few soils from further east, an Indian head clay, an Indian head loam, and we had a Melford in there. When you look at the yield response, the grain yield response compared to our unfertilized control, two and a half and five kilograms of zinc zinc added a zinc sulfate per hectare. Some of the soils, a couple of them were quite responsive. The Fox Valley is shown here. The Hatton was quite responsive. Some of them didn't show any response here like the, like the Chaplin. A couple even showed a trend towards a negative yield response. And then these soils here, uh, further east, higher organic matter, we tended not to see a response, uh, no response to the added uh, zinc sulfate on those, on those soils. Moving out into the field, uh, some work that was done by uh, Sarah Anderson as part of her master's thesis research work, looking at broadcast and incorporated zinc sulfate in a couple of field trials, uh, showed no significant response of lentil. And there were three different lentil varieties uh, in this trial. Uh, this is uh, the results at two sites, one in South Central Saskatchewan uh, near Central Butte that had quite low uh, zinc availability in the soil, it's low extractable zinc content. Our Saskatoon site had quite high extractable available zinc, but we didn't see any response to added zinc. Uh, very similar yields at both locations. Now this soil was a fairly calcareous soil at Central Butte and indeed uh, when we looked at uh, the fate of the added fertilizer zinc in that soil we find that the zinc is readily fixed adsorbed by carbonates uh, the lime in that soil and uh, that uh, uh, showed up when we looked at the uh, fate of the zinc in different uh, zinc fractions extracted from the soil as shown here, uh, where we added our zinc fertilizer, a lot of that zinc that we added ended up in what is called the carbonate bound fraction. And that may have been a factor uh, associated with the lack of response that we saw at that site. It was broadcast and incorporated, perhaps banded would have been better or a foliar application, which unfortunately 
ultimately we did not have as a treatment uh, treatment in our in our trial. We also didn't see much residual effect either in terms of a, a response in the wheat that was growing the following year on those plots. Uh, for P response to zinc, uh, we see some trends for positive response of P to zinc fertilization in our, our polyhouse, our greenhouse work, but it was really only statistically significant for, for one organic soil. And uh, just some data from our, our polyhouse study by uh, Nobar Rahman here. This was on a, a scepter soil, uh, soil of... Uh, uh, of high clay content, but uh, low extractable available zinc. And as we can see here on the P response to zinc fertilization, our control, we've got a couple of, 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 of soil applications here and a foliar and uh, certainly a trend there towards uh, a, res a positive response to uh, zinc fertilization of the P on that soil, but it wasn't statistically significant at the, uh, the 5% level. And I guess just probably reflects just that very ability that we that that we encounter especially in in in, in zinc and and levels in the soil and response to to fertilization the one significant effect that we did see in zinc fertilization of that scepter associated soil was a significant increase in the concentration of zinc in the grain associated with the fertilization with zinc and why is that important well, a higher zinc concentration in grain uh, is desired by uh, countries that are purchasing uh, pulses from Canada in which uh, zinc deficiency issues in the human population may exist. And so a high, higher grain zinc concentration is desirable for its human nutritional value. And in, in some countries in the Middle East, there is more widespread incidence of zinc deficiency in the human population and a higher concentration of zinc in the grain, uh, in fact, is desirable uh, in, those country, in those countries uh, that are, are purchasing and using uh, pulse crops in, in human consumption. Uh, I thought I'd say just a little bit about faba bean uh, uh, and in relation to uptake of zinc, uh, some work by uh, Sarah Klippenstein in, in her MSc research work here at the U of S. Uh, uh, we have four sites in Saskatchewan and this is zinc uptake in kilograms per hectare. Uh, the uh, uh, orange are, is the zinc in the straw and in the purple pink here is the zinc in the grain. So total zinc uptake by the faba beans, and we had some pretty impressive faba bean yields in this study, uh, total zinc uptake uh, is around about 0.3 kilograms per hectare or about a quarter of a pound per acre. So again, micronutrient uptake in terms of pounds per acre or kilograms per hectare, it's, it's definitely small, that's why they're micronutrients. But also you can see here, I think for all of the sites that we had here, here, uh, in this study that uh, the vast majority of the zinc that's taken up by the faba bean is contained in the in the in the grain okay the last micro element I'm going to talk about is iron and I guess if I was giving this presentation uh, 15 years ago before soybeans had ever made their way into Western Canada I probably wouldn't even talk about iron So you see it here in some soybeans that I took a, a field picture from the field uh, 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 in 2016 uh, in Saskatchewan. And this is referred to as iron deficiency chlorosis or IDC. And a specific set of soil and environmental uh, conditions tends to lead to this iron deficiency chlorosis. In terms of soil conditions, high pH coupled with poor drainage, a period of saturation, high nitrates, high carbonate contents, uh, a bit of salinity, uh, that tends to aggravate iron deficiency in the soil. And in fact, soybeans tend to be rather inefficient users of iron. 
And uh, this iron deficiency chlorosis, an issue has been around for a, a while and been recognized in traditional soybean growing areas in the United States, the Midwestern United States, North Dakota, and so on. And so uh, this has been addressed uh, through uh, genetics, through development of varieties that are IDC resistant. And so as I say, some varieties are more sensitive to iron deficiency than others. And for soybean varieties, IDC ratings are provided, and I think are a very good useful tool uh, in selection of a soybean variety, especially if you're concerned about uh, conditions that are going to lead to iron deficiency chlorosis in the soybean crop. We have done some research work on response of soybean to iron fertilization. Uh, Ryan Hangs uh, uh, worked with me uh, for a couple of years uh, in, in, in a trial uh, that we conducted in Southern Saskatchewan uh, near Central Butte, 2015-2016, uh, where we had soil conditions that were conducive to the development of iron deficiency chlorosis. A high pH, a little bit saline, a high nitrate content, a lower slope position. And in this research work, uh, we had two soybean varieties, an IDC sensitive variety, Musiman, and an IDC tolerant variety, which was McLeod. Now, what we found in this work in the first year of the study at the location, 2015, we had very dry conditions in May, May, June, and July. There really was no period where we had any kind of soil saturation or flooding, and we didn't see any response to iron fertilization or really any varietal difference that we could attribute to uh, sensitivity to the, to the uh, uh, iron deficiency, chlorosis. Now, 2016, however, was different. Uh, we had the same kind of soil conditions at our site, but it was wetter. And we had a period of soil saturation in June. And under those conditions that were, we had, we seemed to have maybe everything come together and we did see IDC develop in our iron deficiency sensitive variety, Musiman. And in that case, we did see a significant response of the IDC sensitive variety to foliar iron application, while the IDC tolerant variety, not surprisingly, did not respond to the iron fertilization treatments. And looking at this data here, uh, this was the IDC susceptible Musiman uh, variety. This is our, our unfertilized control. Black is grain yield, um, um, clear is the straw yield, and then our cross hatch is our total grain plus straw. Uh, what we can see here, folks, is that our soil applied iron uh, really wasn't very effective, either iron sulfate or iron chelate, uh, in giving us any yield increase. But our foliar application, particularly our foliar chelated iron application, did, did give us a significant uh, yield increase, uh, grain yield increase on this IDC susceptible uh, soybean variety. And I guess overall, I would say, you know, probably genetics is the best defense when iron deficiency chlorosis is a concern. But uh, foliar application of iron, I guess based, we recognize it's based on only, on only one site in one year, but it may be a suitable rescue treatment. Uh, soybeans have been indicated to, in some cases, grow out of the iron deficiency, uh, but, uh, but certainly that we do see some, some, some potential benefit from this study at, at one site of, uh, of uh, using the uh, foliar iron as a, as a kind of, of rescue to address that, uh, that onset of IDC. Okay, to, to wrap up then, uh, some final thoughts. Uh, certainly, I think micronutrients uh, need to be considered as, as part of the overall balance of, of essential nutrients that's required to optimize the yield, the economic return. Uh, they do seem to be a more important consideration when you're aiming for the, for the top of the, of, of the yield curve. They do have a close relationship to soil and environmental conditions and some, some uh, 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 interactions there that are very important to, I think, consider and that can, can certainly make it difficult and challenging to predict the, the likelihood of a response. Certainly that variability, the spatial variability, the patchy nature of micronutrient deficiencies does make them an obvious target for precision fertilization where one can identify that particular area or zone and then apply the micronutrient only to that zone where you're where where the response to uh, uh, fertilization is is most likely to be seen. 
but uh, I guess any way you slice it, folks, uh, you know, it's not easy to nail down. And, and that's why the, the multiple evidence approach uh, uh, is really the best for identifying and, and verifying uh, deficiency and, and getting the best handle on where you're likely to see a response to the uh, uh, micronutrient fertilizers that are added for, for pulse production or indeed really for, for any crop that's, uh, that's out there. And so with that, I'd like to thank the folks that have helped us along the way in, in conducting some of the research work that I've, uh, I've spoken to you about. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Glenda, to, uh, to uh, uh, bring forward the, uh, the, the question and answer session. Great. Thank you very, very much for all of your information, Jeff, and your time today. We are getting some questions in. So as we begin to ask the questions that have come in, please feel free to continue to post any questions that you may have in the question box on your GoToWebinar screen. So uh, with that, we'll get started on the questions that have come in, Jeff. One of them um, is about using micronutrients in combination with uh, herbicide applications to improve crop tolerance to yellow flash from the herbicide applications. I don't know if you are able to comment on that and does that, if it does aid in reducing that yellow flash, does it have the potential then to lead to increased yields? Yeah, and I'm not sure, I, I don't have any research uh, experience with that. I, I've come across that that uh, a suggestion or indication a, a few times. Uh, from a physiological standpoint, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I, I guess in terms of, uh, of the herbicide, the herbicide action, uh, it may be related to where you, you might see a little bit more potential for injury. Oftentimes it's related to environmental uh, conditions. Uh, those environmental conditions that are the same kinds of conditions that may be resulting in perhaps a little bit of increased or, or injury or less tolerance to a herbicide might also be the same kind of environmental conditions, let's say cool, wet, that might restrict the uptake of a micronutrient. So you might see a kind of coincidence there between the application of a herbicide and the application of a micronutrient. Uh, but, but overall, a direct physiological interaction there that the, that the herbicide is causing uh, some issue with a, a nutritional supply, physiological supply of zinc in the plant that fertilization may overcome. I, I'm not sure whether, uh, whether there's a lot of, uh, of evidence or research work that's been done to, 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 to directly address that. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, the next question is, um, can applications of micronutrients lead to toxicity? And if so, which ones and what would be considered excess amounts? Yeah, I guess, you know, for some of the micronutrients, there's a fairly fine line between uh, sufficiency and toxicity. Probably the best example of that or the best is boron. Uh, where there's a fairly narrow line between sufficiency and toxicity and where repeated application every year in soils in which have low ability to bind the boron and the boron tends to stay in soil solution could result in, 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 in toxicity issues. I think as well, uh, copper is also one that, that may be of concern in producing toxicity, particularly if it's placed right in the seed row. So that's why, for example, recommendations for copper applied in the soil to avoid a seed row application uh, to separate it from the seed or use broadcast and incorporate so those would be the the the, the, the two micronutrient elements I talked about copper iron and zinc uh, probably copper uh, and and also although not really a, a much of an issue reported for for boron deficiencies in pulse crops but nonetheless boron is is, is one to watch out for as well uh, for that, for that uh, uh, issue of, of of putting on too much and ending up with a with a toxicity problem. Great. Um, just some questions now on where you would find information on levels of sufficiency of micronutrients in plant material and soil levels um, amounts to apply if necessary based on those yeah. levels. 
So I guess, uh, you know, in terms of, of interpreting a, a diagnostic criterion, uh, like a soil assessment or a tissue test, uh, in many cases, uh, the agencies that offer that service also provide a, 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 a key that, 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 that translates that, that level into anticipated deficiency, uh, marginal sufficiency, or, or toxicity. Uh, there's also information in a lot of the, of the soil uh, fertility textbooks on uh, deficiency sufficiency ranges uh, that are also useful but again one has to always be careful especially with the uh, uh, tissue testing that the uh, level that's uh, provided there uh, is specific to the species of plant uh, the plant age, and if it's a plant part, to the type of plant part that's sampled. So one needs to look at those tables of, uh, of diagnostic criterion very carefully and make sure that you're comparing apples to apples in terms of the, the part that you had analyzed is that criterion relevant or specific to that? And again, uh, you know, for micronutrient availability assessments in the soil uh, is dependent on you, you, uh, different type of, of extraction or assessment technique will give different values uh, just inherent to, to the different methodology that's, uh, that's used. So one always needs to make sure that when you're comparing diagnostic criterion to, uh, 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 to a key that enables interpretation to make sure that what you're comparing is relevant to the uh, to the uh, analysis technique that was used uh, for developing the uh, for developing the criterion. Okay, thanks, Jeff. That kind of leads into the next question about uh, when. So the question is about when tissue sampling a crop, because particularly say with micronutrients, but maybe macro as well, because nutrients vary in mobility in the plant. What is the best way to sample the plant to get a good reading of? Um, micro and macronutrients. So is there an ideal crop stage or crop part that one should be sampling? Yeah, and I, I guess I, I don't have a lot of experience that or have, haven't really dealt with that in a real systematic matter. So I guess I would say what I'm going to comment here is more or less a, a kind of reflection of, of things over the, over the years. But I would say here in Western Canada, I still tend to support for the majority of the, you know, the small grains crops to take a, a above ground plant sample, the whole plant. And uh, and I think that's a, a you know a pretty good a pretty good indicator. Uh, you know sometimes uh, there are issues with mobility in the plant uh, that can affect things like uh, the the ultimate seed fill. And sometimes you know in a little bit deeper investigation, a comparison of young plant part versus old plant part might be an indicator where there's an issue in ability of that micronutrient to be translocated through the plant, and then maybe whether a foliar application would be warranted. But in a lot of cases I think taking a whole above ground plant sample and noting the age of that and of course the particular species of the plant obviously is uh, I, I think a pretty sound approach to uh, to getting a, a useful uh, uh, assessment of micronutrient uh, nutritional status uh, in a crop a small grains okay thanks Jeff there was I guess maybe a, a comment slash question um but what it was around do you find maybe that also high clay soils have the potential to have a tendency for micronutrient deficiency um as well as sandy soils so kind of those two opposite extremes yeah. Yeah, that, I, and I think that's that's a good comment, and that's why generalizations are dangerous. And I have to say, that's why when we look at correlations or do our PCA analysis, uh, looking at relationships between a soil property and, let's say, predicted availability or available levels in the soil, or even uh, uh, uptake by the plant or response to micronutrient fertilization, our correlation coefficients are never one. <laughs> They're usually a whole lot smaller than that, and sometimes we find no significant significant relationships and and that's because uh, you know in some cases uh, you know clay soils for example although they may have a good ability to hang on to and retain a micronutrient element and uh, protect it from leaching and there may also be minerals in that clay size fraction that are releasing that available micronutrient and providing a slowly available long-term source in fact under certain conditions uh, cold temperatures uh, clay soils as well generally Tend to have uh, uh, inherently a low ability of nutrients to move within those clay soils because of very 
small, tortuous uh, uh, pathways for movement because the pores are very small. So nutrient movement is often restricted in a clay soil. And if we have conditions in the field, like for example, very dry, uh, cold temperatures, that can further restrict the ability of that micronutrient element to move in the soil. So when you put a, a clay texture on top of that where things are kind of hard to move with to begin with, indeed, uh, you may see a deficiency of a micronutrient arise in a, in a heavy textured soil. Uh, there may be lots of it available in the soil perhaps, but it just can't move from one part of the soil to that root surface where the uh, it, it can then be taken up into the plant. Great. Thanks, Jeff. A couple questions, I guess, just around the specific trials that you presented. Yeah. Um, one, was the zinc testing that was done um, were the sites selected because they had low soil test levels or were they randomly selected fields? Uh, we, we, went, we, went, we, went across, we went across provinces and we got 47 soils. The 15 soils that we ended up using, we felt provided a good range of soil properties that were likely to be encountered across the prairies. And we had everything from, you know, uh, very, very sandy, low organic matter soils to, to peat soils, pure organic soils. And we tended to deal with those separately. We, 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 uh, we uh, uh, when we did our, our, looked at the relationships between soil properties and, uh, and uh, response to fertilization, micronutrient availability, we tended to separate out the mineral soils and the organic soils as shown. But really, no, they were, they were, they were selected to be a range of soils, soil properties in which a micronutrient nutrient deficiency might be suspected. Now, of course, we were dealing with a rotation, so we had wheat, peas, and canola. So, you know, we weren't just specifically looking for one nutrient element, we were looking for a combination. So I think that I think the soils that we worked with are soils that, yeah, you might suspect a micronutrient deficiency in one of the three based on the properties, but not all of them. And we wanted to have a wide range of properties in there in which we could look at our correlations to the soil properties to determine how good they were predictors of micronutrient availability and fertilizer response. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, next if, question you is use, if you use uh, zinc impregnated uh, zinc phosphate zinc fertilizer, fertilizer, is there still a risk for negative? Oh, hello? Oh, sorry, Glenn, I oh. think you're cutting out. Okay, am I good now? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can hear. I can I can hear most of what you said. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. I'll try one more time. If you use a zinc impregnated phosphate fertilizer, is there still a risk for negative yield impact in P deficient soils? Were you able to the, hear that? It, oh, not the last part. One more time, Glenn, to give okay. it a try. Yeah. If you use a zinc impregnated phosphate fertilizer, is there still a risk for negative yield impact in P deficient soils? I would say I would say not. Although I mean, we it's a very interesting concept and something that would be would be certainly useful to follow up down the road is to look at at uh, different phosphorus uh, uh, fertilizers and fertility levels in combination with with the zinc. But I would say I would say no. The only time that we saw this negative interaction where you added copper and zinc, and it seemed to be where you added the two together on a very phosphorus deficient soil. Uh, that's where we saw this, 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 this uh, a negative effect on, 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 on production. And so if you've got phosphorus present there in sufficient amounts, I would say the likelihood of seeing that negative interaction would be very small. Okay. Um... But just another, I guess, comment, the results in the tissue samples may indicate the deficiency levels, but they don't seem to identify the yield target. So how can we identify correctly what deficiency is compared to the target? Yeah, and that probably, 
reflect just a, the, the difficulty in, in extending tissue test criterion to an actual prediction of fertilization response. How much to add to when, the environmental factors that combine to, to, to that, what does that amount of micronutrient in that plant sample at that time actually mean in terms of fertilizer response. That's where calibration is needed. And unfortunately, there's probably not enough calibration data yet to be, you know, really uh, conclusive in a lot of cases uh, to relate that tissue concentration to an actual, uh, you know, how much fertilizer then needs to be added, what's going to be the yield response to that. I think it's just a case of, of, of right now of, of lack of a good database to, uh, to, to, to be more, uh, to be more uh, accurate in that type of, of, uh, of prediction. Okay. Um, in your opinion, which method is more preferable for micronutrient application? Soil application or foliar application? And then there's a comment that the soil applied causes binding and foliar has a kind of a critical line between sufficiency and toxicity. So how would you, what would your preference be? Yeah, yeah then that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. And uh, I, I can, when I go into the literature and, and I've looked in, as well as the, as the, the students and folks who have done, done reviews on this and writing up their literature reviews and you, you certainly see uh, contrasting results out of studies, uh, superiority of soil applied versus foliar applied. I know some field studies that were done with copper in the past showed the foliar applied to be superior, for example, to a broadcast or broadcast and incorporate type, type, uh, type application. Uh, and that certainly may be explained on the basis of greater fixation of the soil applied. But it does depend on the soil's potential to fix or bind that 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 micronutrient uh, micronutrient element. I know in some of the work that we did with with zinc on on lentils, there wasn't a lot of difference under controlled conditions, and this was in a greenhouse between the foliar applied and the soil applied uh, in terms of, of of whether or not we saw any response. Uh, some of our most recent work that we've done uh, seems to have indicated, for example, that uh, you know the soil banded uh, uh, copper banded separately was superior to the the, uh, the 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 foliar applications. But again, that's done in a pot on warm soils, which is different than, uh, of course, what you would find in the field. And that's one of the limitations of of doing work in a in in, in, in a controlled environment. Um, I think a residual effect, uh, certainly a greater potential residual effect from a larger amount of a soil applied micronutrient salt, you know, uh, 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 compared to a, a, a foliar applied uh, where uh, what doesn't go into the leaf is going to end up maybe running off and just uh, sticking there on the on the surface but uh, you know i think as pointed out i think you know there's advantages and disadvantages to 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 each of them in terms of of, of what might happen and a person can indeed predict that uh, soil applied probably greater potential for fixation foliar applied a couple of things there uh, the question referred to toxicity that's a potential uh, a factor but also i think with foliar applied you know is it is it too late uh, I know the general mantra is, you know, micronutrients are taken up early on. Uh, some of them are immobile in the plant and by applying it to, you know, foliar, you can get it to where it needs to be. But I think that is somewhat dependent on the, uh, the conditions in the, in, in the field. And, and maybe some of our work has indicated, uh, and I'm thinking here particularly with boron, that perhaps uh, the reason we didn't see a response was we were a little bit too late off the mark in getting it onto the plant. It's a kind of a long convoluted answer, but uh, no, I don't think I could say, uh, you know, right now, one is better than the other. Okay. What are your thoughts on seed placing products which have zinc in them? Uh, yeah, and I guess, you know, a little bit of, of uh, I guess when it comes to that, uh, that issue of, uh, of zinc, uh, so it was already brought up, uh, uh, having it associated with a, as, as part of a, uh, uh, a phosphorus uh, as part of a, of a phosphorus uh, a fertilizer. Uh, 
I would say probably, you know, in terms of, of, of zinc application, uh, with the seed large amounts, I'd still like to keep that one out of the seed row. Uh, I guess our current recommendations are uh, that uh, zinc, you know, zinc sulfate would not be would not be seed placed, but could be banded uh, separately or broadcast uh, and incorporated. So again, that maybe comes up a little bit to the uh, toxicity issue with micronutrients. In our research work, we never did any work with zinc placed in the seed row. It was broadcast, incorporated, or put in a band in soil in a, in a, in a, in a pot or tray. Okay, I have a, a maybe a more macro question for you here, Jeff. But uh, are we able to foliarly apply P and K to peas and beans to facilitate uptake during rapid reproductive growth? Foliar application of P and K to beans. And uh, beans and peas. Beans or yeah. peas. Yeah. And I guess what we've found with our, our work that we've done so far with a foliar application of phosphorus, monopotassium phosphate. So it's, it's what the, the foliar phosphorus source also contained potassium. So we haven't actually looked at the potassium aspect of it, but, but maybe it, it, it does help address the, the question. Uh, foliar application uh, can be uh, uh, used as, as a top up but there's a limit to how much can be absorbed through the through the through the leaves and certainly we find that you know when we try to put all uh, you know put all of the phosphorus on through the foliage it doesn't work very well and our yield responses are muted uh, we really didn't with peas see much response to foliar pea or pea fertilization in general in our trials, I think reflecting the fact that we really didn't have a highly phosphorus deficient soil out there in the field. And peas are pretty good scavengers of phosphorus in, in, in general. But recognize that when it comes to foliar pea, there's a limit to how much you can get in through the, through the leaves. So more of a top up uh and then and that that, that that might be effective rather than uh than, than trying to 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 get a whole bunch uh, into the plant in that manner great uh do you have any idea on what micronutrients would interfere with the nodulation process or what micronutrients are crucial for the nodulation process well, I guess there's a couple of micronutrients I mentioned right at the outset that are involved in nitrogen fixation, uh, and that is cobalt and molybdenum, but really deficiency of those are unheard of in Saskatchewan soils. And uh, I, so I don't really see that they've ever, ever, never seen any evidence that they were ever uh, a limitation to, to nitrogen fixation in, in uh, uh, legumes in, in, in Western Canada. Uh, Studies directly related to other micronutrients like zinc and nitrogen fixation. Uh, I'm not aware of anything recent, but I think I would speculate. I mean, anything that has a negative effect on plant growth is going to have a negative effect on, on the nitrogen fixation process because that fixation process, that symbiosis uh, with the uh, rhizobium in the nodule and the plant is, is so closely related. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on adding molybdenum to herbicide applications on peas and lentils? No experience there at all. I, I, I would hesitate to comment on that. I, I, I don't know whether there would be an effect or not. Uh, molybdenum's really, really received little or no attention here in, in Saskatchewan, and, and I haven't done any work with it myself. And again, it is an element that is involved in nitrogen fixation. Okay, do you, are you aware of any quick tools um, or equipment that can check micronutrient deficiencies in plants or where you would send those samples into? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, that uh, really an assessment of the concentration in the tissue through a lab analysis, a digestion uh, is the, is the, the, 
the, tr the common way. I mean, that's, that's really the, the, the gold standard in terms of assessing micronutrient status is to look at the concentration and that the, the, the total concentration of element in the plant. Uh, anything else that might be related to color or whatever, I think it would be very risky. So uh, I cannot think of any sort of a rapid tissue in field color type uh, based assessment of micronutrient deficiency that one could use as a as a diagnostic. I think that those samples do need to be collected and uh, sent into a lab for an appropriate uh, digestion analysis to determine the concentration in the plant material. That's my knowledge anyway. Uh, there may be something out there that I'm not aware of, but uh, I, I, a few years back, people were working with handheld um, ion meters that you might be able to crush the sap out and measure the concentration of the ion in the field, but uh, that's mainly for nitrate and for potassium. For microelements, I'm not sure whether it can be done or not. I don't think so. Okay, thank you, Jeff. I know. apologize for those on the line. I know we've gone a little over our time. There are a few more questions which we will uh, maybe just send to you, Jeff, and see if we can uh, perhaps email them back out to the people that have been on the line when we ask for CCA numbers. Um, and that way we can wrap up and get people back going with their day. I would like to uh, thank you, Again, Jeff, very much for speaking to us today on micronutrients and pulse production. And thank Andrea for organizing the session today. And a big thank you for all of you for joining us today, all your great questions and your participation. Once again, a reminder for CCAs that an email will be sent out to you um, that you will need to reply to with your CCA number in, or CCSC number in order to get your credits. And at that time, again, please feel free to provide suggestions for future webinar topics. Um, Feedback and suggestions are always appreciated. Please save the date for our next webinar, which will take place at noon on May 9th, and it will be covering MRLs to maintain export markets, and it will be presented by Pulse Canada. You can sign up for this webinar from the SPG website under News and Events. Thank you so much for your time today, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining in.